when we put up the call for papers, we got a lot of, lot of very interesting abstracts. Um, but myself and my colleagues agreed that there were, there were three we really wanted to, to put on this first day um, that seemed particularly, particularly interesting. Uh, and what we're going to do now is just have, over, over um, the 90 minutes, just three short papers and, um, and then 20 minutes each with 10 minutes of, qu of questions or so. So our first speaker, Geoffrey Bishop from St. Louis University. Thank you. So I had a 7,000 word essay and I'm not gonna read that to you. I rewrote it yesterday to get it down to 2,000 words, about 100 words a minute, and that's usually about right. Uh, I'll jump right in and I'll just read the paper. So with the rise of technology in medicine, there has been a correlated collapse in the distinction between therapy and enhancement. While thinkers like Leon Cass drew our attention to the loss of this distinction more than 30 years ago, therapy and enhancement have become one and the same activity in the technological imaginary of transhumanism. They've become just enhancement. In the older way of thinking in which therapy and enhancement could be distinguished, the human was understood to have a nature or to belong to a natural kind. Therapy restored human function to some natural and therefore normal state for the kind of thing that it is, whereas enhancement was understood as optimizing or maximizing a natural capacity or as adding or an additional capacity that is not natural or normal to the human animal. The collapse in, the, in these domains of meaning that once separated therapy and enhancement resulted from a shift in thinking about the ontology of the body. One can only distinguish between therapy and enhancement if one has a robust notion of human nature. But in the transhuman imaginary or transhumanist imaginary, the human animal is no longer conceived as having a nature. Thus, those activities once deemed therapies are now seen to be part of a spectrum of activities aimed at enhancing the life of the human animal beyond merely human capacities. How did, this, how did the human body cease being a thing with a nature and a telos and become mere material to be enhanced or manipulated? Martin Heidegger has an answer to this question, or at least gives us a hint to an outline for a possible answer. In his essay, Modern Science, Metaphysics, and Mathematics, Heidegger sets out to challenge the usual reading of the differences between ancient and medieval conceptions of science on the one hand and contemporary conceptions of science on the other. The usual way of characterizing the ancient or medieval thought is to say that ancient sciences were dependent upon principles and concepts and ideas and that modern sciences focus on empirical facts. Heidegger shows that this is a facile way of reading the differences and it is flat wrong. He shows that the ancients, particularly Aristotle, drew on empirical facts in a way not dissimilar to Newton and that Galileo was himself beholden to uh, this idea of men, uh, mente concipio uh, omne secluso impedimento. I think in my mind something movable that is left entirely to itself when in fact there is no such thing as a thing left entirely unto itself. So in other words, Heidegger goes through and shows that moderns have concepts uh, and principles that it draws on and that the ancients also had empirical facts. So he collapses that, uh, that primary problem or the primary way we think of that problem. Yet the primary purpose of Heidegger's essay is to show that in fact the main difference between ancient or medieval science on the one hand and modern science is primarily a difference in mathematics. The difference is that the ancient way of thinking about mathesis was that mathesis was not a kind of logic that resides above the phenomena by which we come to organize and systematize empirical data. Rather, for Aristotle and the Greeks, mathematics is intimately tied to both an activity of the mind, but also in the things themselves. In fact, he argues, uh, Heidegger does, that mathematics derives from the things. The phenomenological account of mathematics is a strand of phenomenology that Heidegger inherited from his teacher Husserl. I do not ha uh, have the space here to walk us through Heidegger's entire argument, so I will leave it at this. The purported closeness of 
Modern science to data is dependent upon a version of mathematics, Heidegger claims, that is radically separated from the phenomena because it has become a projection of the subject onto the world, a grid of space-time that has changed the way we think about nature and the nature of nature. In short, Heidegger asks, uh, modern science, Heidegger claims, asks that the things of reality, asks the things of reality to, con to conform to our way of thinking about them. Modern science purports to be about things, but mathematical perception skips over the very things that it purports to con uh, ponder. Heidegger notes that it, is pri uh, that it was primarily this different understanding of mathematics that led to a shift in what he calls uh, the ontotheology or the metaphysics, or maybe even we might call it a social imaginary between ancient science and modern science. And he gives a better account of the radical differences between the two rather than a fast, the facile way that we think about it that I uh, described earlier. For starters, this shift in mathematics results in a shift of meta in metaphysics, claims Heidegger. Uh, let's look at how the ancient science differed from modern science with regard to motion and place, for example. To the ancient mind, bodies had time and place by virtue of the kinds of things that they were. The motion of bodies was a motion initiated from within the body. Motion, gives, uh, motion begins by virtue of some determination grounded in the body itself, such that the body itself, by virtue of its motion, would achieve a new status in being in moving to that place. In other words, telos was tied to place as it moved to its proper place in its proper time. That's the ancient way of thinking about it. Motion in general, metabole, the alteration of something into something else. Motion in this wide sense includes, for instance, turning pale or blushing. But it is also an alteration when a body is transferred from one place to another. This being transported is an alteration in being. The, uh, the being of the body has a definite relation to place. Once the body arrived in its proper place and its proper time, it actualizes its own being in the ancient metaphysics, in the ancient way of thinking about it. So once the body arrives, it achieves its proper place. It's intimately tied. Its being is tied to place. In circular motion, the body has its place in the motion itself. And for this reason, such motion is perpetual and truly in being. So the being of a body is tied to its place, and bodies in perpetual circular motion in the ancient mindset were in their place in their own being. So the being of the body is intimately tied to place as a kind of fulfillment, a fruition, a belonging, and harmony. Thus, when a body is in its proper place, there is harmony, and only a violent force can change it from its natural proper place in its nature of, in its nature of being. So I'll refer to this ancient or medieval idea of the tendency of bodies moving by virtue of the kind of thing that it is as a thick metaphysics of body. However, on the contemporary way of thinking, the nature of the body itself is secondary to its motion. By the time we get to Newton, bodies become similar in all regards. First, earthly and heavenly bodies become one and the same. The motion in a straight line becomes the norm for all bodies as opposed to circular motion, which was thought to be more perfect in the ancient mindset. Place becomes incidental to the body in the modern mindset. Motion becomes separated from the being of the body and is therefore external to the body. Motion is seen as only a change in position, but position is not place. Thus, all motion is a kind of violence against rectilinear motion or against inertia, whether inertia is state, uh, the inertia of stasis or the inertia of motion. So the concept of nature itself changes, Heidegger claims, by becoming the mode of the variety of the changing relative positions of body the manner in which they are present in space and time. Motion is no longer the inner principle of the body, but something external to the body, something that 
uh, is, acts violently against the body. Therefore, the method of questioning nature itself, Heidegger claims, had to change. So Heidegger, Heidegger concludes the following six points, which are pertinent for what I want to say uh, next. The mathematical is mente conciperi, to think in the mind. A pro it is a project that purports to be about the thinginess of things, but skips over the things themselves. There is a projection to the way things are taken to be before they are encountered or as Heidegger calls it, axiomata. The axiomatic then, the mathematical, as axiomatic, the mathematical project is an anticipation of the behavior of things or bodies before they are encountered, a basic plan for the way all bodies are supposed to behave and the way all bodies are. Number four, as a basic plan, the measure is included in the laying out of the things as a mapping of position in space and time. And nature is now not in the body, but nature is the realm of the uniform space-time context of emotion. Number five, bodies thus have no concealed qualities, powers and capacities when laid in the space-time grid of the basic plan. And what appears is the basic plan, what and, what, and what appears is what the basic plan can measure time, space, and motion. And thus, Heidegger claims, positivism is born. Number six, because there is a uniformity of, quote, all bodies according to space, time, and motion, there is a universal, uniform measure as an essential determinant of things, unquote. So for our purposes, we can conclude with a quote from Heidegger. All bodies are alike, no motion is special, Every place is like every other, each moment like any other. Every force becomes determinable only by the change of motion which it causes, this change in motion being understood as a change in place. All determinations of bodies have one basic blueprint, according to which the natural process is nothing but a space-time determination of the motion of points of, of, of the motion of points of mass. The fundamental design of nature at the same time circumscribes its realm as everywhere uniform. In short, nature is no longer in the body, but in the motion behind the body. Motion is primarily then about the forces, about power. And I will refer to this most basic element of metaphysics and modern natural science as a power ontology, the power relations of bodies to one another. This new way of thinking scientifically also began to take root in medical science in the late 18th century with Xavier Bichat and with, uh, in the 19th century with Claude Bernard. Uh, Bernard was uh, heralded as the Isaac Newton of physiology. Suffice it to say that any notion of substance was lost in these physiological sciences because the notion of substance smacked too much of vitalism. Life was understood as the series of mechanical functions that resist death. In fact, Xavier Bichat says, life is nothing more than the series of functions that resist death. Okay. Entropy is the natural status, matter falling still. French thinkers also, uh, but, but this new metaphysics would also take effect not only in physiology, uh, but also in society or in social thinking as well. French thinkers like Adolphe Catelet and uh, Emile Durkheim both thought that just as the new science could describe the movement of bodies in the heavens, the mechanique celeste, right? So also it could describe the movement of bodies in society, mechanique sociale. For English thinkers, we can see the same notion of social mechanics in the works of Jeremy Bentham, who wrote books on the principles of legislation and morals, and created, he created the table of the springs of action, the latter of which delineated, quote, and this is a quote from the table written by Bentham, uh, the several springs of action by which, on the several occasions in question, human conduct, human action, is liable to be influenced and determined. These several springs of action considered as being in operation and as giving birth to whatever acts or modes or, of conduct 
may respectively be the result. In other words, he wanted to think about the social mechanics, the laws that govern society very much along the way of the laws that govern the universe, heavenly bodies. So the whole point is that the springs of action induce people to behave socially, politically, economically, and morally. In short, once we know the mechanique sociale, we can get the machine of social action to work. Now, I can return to my preliminary remarks about the loss of the distinction between therapy and enhancement and how that relates to the trans, what I call the transhumanist imaginary. There could be little doubt that bodies, whether we refer to celestial bodies in modern, early modern science or the bodies of the human animal in physiological and social sciences, which is made up of component parts, had uh, lost any sense of substance, any thick metaphysical content in the 19th and 20th century physiology and in social philosophy. Thus, the body is merely a product of the concatenation of forces, the metabolic forces, energy, for example, as it overcomes the tendency toward metabolic decay or entropy. Because there is no real substance, just sub, sub breaking down of bodies into parts and subparts, and then finally into atoms and then into subatomic particles, et cetera, right? Uh, and all that is left are the energy or uh, uh, force relations of the attractive and uh, forces and uh, uh, forces of repulsion, all the way down. Because there is no substance, no notion of the fruition in such bodies, there can be no robust telos in the body, whether the celestial bodies or atomic bodies are the body of this flesh. The only telos is the telos exerted by the higher powers in the hierarchy of being or rather in the hierarchy of powers in this kind of power ontology. There exists only the higher ordering power, the violent assertion of the will to power over the powers of the concatenation of the forces surrounding the human body and enabling the human body. In modern medical ethics, with its emphasis on autonomy, uh, uh, simply asserts that I get to assert my will to power over the biology of my body this body. This is the dominant way of thinking about, uh, of asserting my will over my body to do with as I will in a medical context, molding it or shaping it into what I will it to be because it has no telos in itself, only the telos that my will to power over my body articulates. It has no nature of its own. This results in a kind of libertarian transhumanism where no other will to power should exert its will over the powers of this body, which is simply the concatenation of the forces of all the particles in this body. So we get the principle of permission. The principle of respect for autonomy then operates on this sort of metaphysical way of thinking. And we see this metaphysics as operative in contemporary articulations of transhumanism. The agential self orders the telos of this particular body, and you as an agent articulate your own telos for your own body. There's also another way of construing this metaphysics that's operated in, that operates in uh, contemporary transhumanism. And it is more like a Nietzschean non-agential will to power that operates and orders the telos of the body or the body politic. According to thinkers like Ray Kurzweil, we are already well beyond the realm of uh, any human mind or any way that we could control uh, technology or control bodies. The laws of social mechanics and the laws of exponential growth of information is so far beyond the capacity of any single human mind to comprehend or any human will's ability to control that we are already living in a post-human techno-evolutionary process. The telos of this view of transhumanism is constructed out of a techno-evolutionary process without any sort of human agency. So on both versions of transhumanism, the fundamental mesophysics seems to be the same. Human bodies, like all bodies, are the result of a concatenation of forces, coalescing into the functioning, infinitely malleable body that has no telos proper to its being, for there is not a proper telos to really any being. It's just raw material to be gathered up and molded into what we will it to be. So the only question is, how is it organized in order towards a telos? And the telos is no longer the telos that resides within a body and potency, 
but must be ordered by either an agential will, an agent, a self, or by the social forces of organization, which is really just a techno-evolutionary process. And thus we have the loss of the distinction between therapy and enhancement, and it is the result of a different kind of metaphysics that animates the entire techno-scientific project that is transhumanism. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, we've got a couple of questions, uh, hopefully, but I'd like to ask one myself first, if that's all right. You should all remain at the podium for a bit. So um, it's very good to have a cogent um, summary of the state of modern science and how it's affected philosophers and philosophical thinking about our world. I think one of the big revolutions of the last few decades has been complex systems. The complex systems, uh, we seem to be recovering teleology because they self-organize. Um, but what surprise me is this doesn't seem to have much impact on people writing on this stuff. So do you want to have, a, do you want to have any comment on say, say that complex one, systems? One more time, so although, um, uh, although we know these things in the science mm -hmm. uh, are taking place, we're studying uh, strange attractors in complex systems which are self-organized towards final forms, uh -huh. um, this, does, this has less impact than I would expect on philosophers of science who seem to still be working with the 19th century model. Yeah. So don't we, do you want to comment on this at all, Yeah, Jeffrey? there, I think there are, uh, so what I would say to that is that, um, first off, uh, in complexity, I think that there is, there, there, there are, at least in, I'm, I'm thinking of this mostly in the way that medical science thinks about problems. Uh, there seems to be no, uh, no telos within the complexity of the body or at least they circumscribe that to say that there is no complexity, even if they might see certain tendencies in, in, in bodies. Um, but I think they would say that that's just because it's so complex that we can't map it out and can't find the determining factors. And if we knew the determining factors, the determining forces. So I think they've already sort of uh, prohibited or proscripted a certain way of thinking about teleology from the get-go. And I think that's just kind of regnant in contemporary medicine, or at least the, the medicine, medical science in the main uh, uh, in the main, okay? Uh, so that, that's the, the first thing. Um, there was another thing I was going to say on that, and now it has escaped me. So okay. well, I'm well, sure you. it was not well, th Thank you anyway. Another question. Would someone let you help me with the microphone, please? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, actually, uh, I was interested in uh, looking at a certain distinction that uh, you probably implied to draw, but that didn't come out uh, very uh, clearly. Okay. Uh, one is that there is a distinction that Heidegger maintains between ontic and the ontological. Sure. And parallel to that is uh, its Totolian distinction between potentiality and impotentiality. Right. So if we club all this together, then it happens to be that body... Uh, can be subjected to a will to power in an unconditional manner. Uh -huh. But the will to power that operates in the body <coughs> comes from elsewhere. It comes from the existing technology, the social relations under which this will to power is exercised. Sure. So the agency of the will to power is not in the body or in the self. Right. Rather, it's a displaced, dispersed kind of agency. Right. Now, now, that's the biggest threat because that takes away the very basis of transhumanism as well. Uh -huh. So the idea of having an ontological transhumanism actually goes against the very grain of ascertaining whether that transhumanism can work in a trans body, trans self, trans technology, or trans social manner. Right. Well, I, I don't. I don't disagree with that. I, I actually think that I, what I would say about the the idea of a of a uh, s an agent that acts independently is that that's already a a, a myth. Uh, that that there are the constitution of a self is a social enterprise, right? And so I don't disagree with 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 that that point at all. I, I think that's a very good point. 
Uh, yeah, hi. Um, you, you present a, a fairly, uh, what seems to my mind to be a fairly polar argument between on the one side almost the unbridled will to power in terms of how we manipulate our bodies and on the other side we have kind of teleology and I guess in medical science we're very aware of, of with a lot of therapies that there are unintended consequences sure. so which not seem neither teleology nor, nor do they seem about you know, applying unbridled autonomy. So how do they fit into your argument would you say? That's a good question. Um, as a person who's put many people on machines, <laughs> uh, aiming at keeping them alive, I, I was a medical practitioner. I practiced medicine. Uh, as a person who's, who's done that, uh, there certainly are untold uh, 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 events that follow from any action that I, that I, I take, many of which I don't and I, I hope are not there. Hopefully I anticipate that they might show up and can somehow prevent those bad things from happening. Um, I think that, that in practice, you're exactly right, that there is not that polarizing dimension. However, because we are aware that there are unintended consequences, that things fall from what we do that we don't intend or we hope to circumscribe or to head off at, at the pass, uh, so to speak, um, however, I think in the main, there is, the, in the way that medical science is carried out, we want to find the one cause that leads to the one effect, almost in the very way that the medical science is constructed, to try to circumscribe those other things that might fall by circumscribing it on the front end, right? To say, look, we're going to limit these things precisely to be able to find the one cause that leads to the one effect. So it's already not, it's already a kind of mythology about uh, a mythology of the way that, that we figure out causes in medicine, that, we, that these subjects and objects are kind of independent and have no contextual relations whatsoever. So I think it's built into the very fabric of the way modern science thinks. And yes, there are ways that we statistically control and we do all of that. There's no doubt that that, it, that, it, it, that, that goes on. However, I think the whole mythology of it is that we know the cause, we will follow, and there we will follow on the effects. Uh, and I think that's just part of the, the very structure of the way we think.